Our next presenter, Gregory Hinton, known uh, well to many of you. Um, his father, I just learned, had been the editor of the uh, Cody Enterprise. Um, Gregory's a former resident fellow here at the center, an associate editor of the Buffalo Bill Papers. He's the author of several newspaper plays, that's intriguing, about Buffalo Bill, and his presentation this morning is entitled After Hours, Buffalo Bill in London. Uh, thanks, Bob, and, and thanks, Tom and Frank, very, very, very much. Um, as Bob just mentioned, from 1956 to uh, 1962, my dad was uh, Kip Hinton, editor of the Cody Enterprise, originally founded by Buffalo Bill. And I'm just kind of wondering, um, I, as a kid, I attended the groundbreaking of this museum in 1958 and the opening in 59 because the Enterprise was covering it. And I'm wondering if anybody else in the room was there. Wow. There you go. OK. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I next would like to say just how proud I am to be uh, uh, um, an, an editor of the papers of William F. Cody. Uh, the 2000 BBCW Fellowship uh, uh, changed my life, and I want to thank Jeremy and Frank and, and Doug for, for including me today uh, uh, here and for supporting my mission for Out West. And uh, uh, as it covered the opening of the uh, Whitney, uh, still going strong, the Enterprise is covering this historic event today. So I'm, I'm very happy to see them. <coughs> so um, I had this notion the other day, and I just went with it. So here we go. So the success of the PBS Masterpiece series, Downton Abbey, broke the mold. And, uh, borrowed heavily on historical events. So I had this idea, it'd be funny if uh, Buffalo Bill had showed up, uh, had paid a call on the Granthams and ran off with Lady Mary. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Downton took place after 1912 and Buffalo Bill's Wild West last visited London in 1903. And so I like to say, who needs uh, Downton Abbey when we have Buffalo Bill in London? Um, prior to Out West, uh, Prior to Out West with Buffalo Bill, I worked in the film industry for over two decades, and my California colleagues tend to call him Wild Bill Cody. They, uh, they know he's a buffalo hunter and uh, maybe a Pony Express rider and that he was murdered in Deadwood. Um, <laughs> now, this, this of course I correct, but uh, you know, you, you gotta, what are you gonna do? Now, to be honest with you, I didn't know a lot about Cody either until a friend gave me a dog-eared 1888 first edition of Buffalo Bill's The Story of the Wild West. And Cody's addendum, The Wild West in England, is a production Bible for a BBC limited series if I, if I ever saw one. Um, pretty much all we have to do is add water. Um, now, I, d I didn't get an official uh, one sheet. I put it on a table to look like I, I grab it, you know, just as I'm walking by to, you know, so, so anyway, thank you for that, Frank. Um, uh, uh, in it, Cody uh, identifies a list of scenes for the director, such as Off Gravesend, Visit of Mr. Gladstone, and Her Majesty Salutes the American Flag. And for the casting agents, he offers a few character breakdowns for, say, Mr. Henry Irving, Miss Ellen Terry, and Bram Stoker, and settings for the production designer, the Lyceum Theater, the Reform Club, and Earl's Court. And each chapter, if you look at it, is essentially an outline for an episode. For instance, hard work line of the season is a who's who crawl of noble notables. Um, it was here that I first read these fateful words, I was dined at Mr. and Mrs. Oscar Wilde's. And I wondered, what do you wear? Who else was there? What'd they serve? What could they possibly have to discuss? So I repeat, who needs Down Abbey when we have the Wild West in England? Um, I think Cody might like the idea that he has inspired a, a, a British period costume drama, and we know that Cody and his proxies never wrote or did anything that couldn't be launched on multiple platforms, so, uh, which in a way uh, uh, he invented. So, so I thought it might be fun as an exercise while hearing Cody at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, surrounded by scholars of, uh, foremost scholars of William F. Cody in the country to ruminate on a concept for one. So I'd like to introduce a few characters in London's theater world, describe the uh, locations around town where they met between performances, and set the scenes where Cody was entertained. Now, in many of the social invitations uh, to Cody found in his scrapbooks, uh, hallmarking the season of 1887, the name Henry Irving uh, pops up uh, uh, 
paving is uh, uh, by way of introduction. Now, with question, without question, Cody credits uh, Irving for paving his way to London. And Cody wrote Irving twice that summer to reassure him of his gratitude. They remained friends for years, as evidenced by uh, Cody's invitation for Irving to visit T.E. Ranch. So uh, who was Henry Irving? Well, allow me to set the stage. This from A.E. Wilson's 1952 book, The Lyceum, quoting theatrical writer J.B. Booth. As we turn out of the Strand up Wellington Street, the three braziers over the portico throw ruddy gleams over the surging crowd and the long lines of carriages whose gleaming panels bear the crests of half Burke's peerage. The finest horses and the finest turnouts in the world are on view, bringing an audience representative of all strata of London society, royalty, the peerage, parliament, the bench, the bar, literature, art, music, and folk who are merely in the swim. Pitt and gallery have been filled long ago by the sternest critics, keenest of enthusiasts. We ascend the steps and enter the heavily carpeted vestibule from an immensely wide staircase covered with thick sock carpets leading to the back of the circle. And on each side of this staircase stand the program attendants, small boys in Eaton suits. For the program girl is not yet. And the programs, almost innocent of advertisement, well and clearly printed in an artistic shade of brown are free. We are still in the days of no fees, and at the top of the staircase, a tall, reddish-bearded man in evening dress greets us. It is Bram Stoker, Irving's faithful friend and manager. To Bram, his chief is a god and can do no wrong. The audience slowly settles in its seats, the murmur of voices dies, and there's a curious hush of expectancy, for one is assisting at the event. The overture finishes, the lights stay down, and the curtain rises. And at last, the entrance of the well-known figure, the tones of the familiar voice, and the lyceum roar of greeting. To this day, Henry Irving is regarded as one of the greatest Shakespearean actor managers in history, not just in England, but anywhere. Ellen Terry, his partner, intimate friend, and muse, was the era's most powerful actress. Together, they're credited for reviving English theater after assuming control of the historic lyceum, lyceum 10 years before the Wild West came to London. The Irving Terry reign is regarded as Lyceum's golden age. As a thin, sickly boy, Henry Irving also overcame a serious speech impediment by, quote, mastering awkward phrases through stubborn repetition. Irving's famous gait, an underscored drag of his foot, tricked his audiences into underestimating him, turning early boos into o later ovations. His drive to transform physical obstacles into assets would forever inform his stagecraft. Irving, who conquered Shylock, Iago, Wolsey, King Lear, and Mephistopheles, had nothing to prove. Just before taking, just before taking over the Lyceum, Irving engaged Bram Stoker, an extremely tall athletic clerk from the Dublin Civil Service, to act as his business manager. A theater devotee and independent critic, Stoker, long a fan of Irving's, had written a discerning critical article of a performance. Irving asked Stoker to supper in his rooms to discuss it. And later in the evening, e evening, Irving spellbound Stoker by a private recitation, which reduced Stoker to, quote, a violent fit of hysterics in his own words. And as evidenced by his comprehensive and admiring personal reminiscences of Henry Irving, Stoker's devotion to him could border on the saccharine. That said, he was also in exceptionally industrious and organized. He'd write anybody and corresponded with Walt Whitman. Yes, the very same Bram Stoker who eventually wrote Dracula two years later, which Irving, figuring that he was the inspiration for the vampire, would dismiss as dreadful. <laughs> During the Lyceum's golden age, Irving and Terry, along with Stoker, toured America numerous times and saw Buffalo Bill's Wild West at Aristina in 1886. This timed with the invitation of John Whitley that Cody bring his Wild West to England the following year to participate in the struggling American exhibition to be held concurrent with Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Irving met Cody that summer or fall, possibly with Stoker, who was on the Cunard passenger list coming and going from Boston to Liverpool that same season. And why does Buffalo Bill appear on the shipboard benefit program with Bram Stoker? It's kind of there at the bottom. Uh, when Cody wasn't on the passenger list, and I wondered, did, did the meeting with Cody inspire Stoker himself to do a bit on Buffalo Bill aboard ship? Ellen Terry and Bram Stoker were good friends. He often acted as her escort. Stoker described the lovely Terry as having fascinated every man, woman, or child she met. 
Terry was witty and down to earth as letters to her friend and understudy Audrey Campbell and others conveyed, conveyed. And a most intriguing observation to ma be made about Irving, Terry, and Stoker is the utter complication of their private lives, attributes they shared with Cody. I love that photo. Uh, Hel Ellen Terry was first married at age 16 to a middle-aged uh, painter named J.W. Watt. After sitting for several portraits, she returned home within a year. Though still married, Terry entered into a long-term relationship with prominent theatrical designer and architect Edward Godwin and had two children by him. She married two times more, but Terry's most rounded significant life partnership was that with Henry Irving, which spanned from 1878 to his death in 1905. Henry Irving and Bram Stoker each had unhappy wives, but never divorced. The, the Lyceum Theater was their true love. Theater often steals every bit of affection a loving spouse might bestow on one's mate. And life in the theater often spawns intense theatrical relationships and not always with the physical component. When Irving died in 1905, Bram Stoker was not included among the pallbearers. Akin to a grieving partner, Stoker received condolence telegrams from around the world, including one from the empathetic John M. Burke, Wild West general manager, whose life mission was similarly devoted to the man and industry that was William F. Cody. Hark, the Abbey Bell last curtain call as, earth, as Earth's autumn leaves as tribute fall. Deepest sympathy for your loss and friend Irving, a man for generations to mourn and posterity to revere, John Burke. A little over a decade later, Burke would die just three months after the death of Cody, whose centennial we celebrate this year, speculated by some from a broken heart. Bram Stoker would die not knowing that the eventual success of his Dracula franchise would assure him more posthumous fame than Irving or Buffalo Bill. In 1982, lecturing on aestheticism and decorative arts, Oscar Wilde's American tour consisted of approximately 150 cities, a third in the American West. Buffalo Bill's combination made nearly as many stops that year. And according to the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, both were in New York on, New on January 9, 1882, with an ad for Cody at the Grand Opera House on page one and Oscar Wilde at Chickering Hall on page two. Wilde twice traversed Wyoming by rail and said if he were a young man in this country, the West would have great charms for him. The fascinated, if not derisive, press he received assured packed houses for Wilde. Many of us know his surprise to find the mining town of Leadville among the most welcoming of his stops. Mining King Horace Tabor named a mine shaft the Oscar in his honor and dropped him by a bucket deep into the pit. <laughs> of Cody's impending visit to England 18, in 1887, Wilde wrote that we have no doubt that London will fully appreciate the show. At the time, Oscar Wilde had been married for three years with two young sons. He had yet to write a novel or the famous plays that made his name. He was just famous for being infamous. Wilde was a spendthrift and quickly exhausted their assets to create a suitable residence at 16 Tite Street in, the Lon in London's fashionable Chelsea district. Candace Wilde was attractive, intelligent, and unprepared for life as Mrs. Oscar Wilde. And as Wilde's Irish friend Stoker later had written, Buffalo Bill struck London like a planet and the Wilds had work to do. Constance twice communicated with Cody, first through this formal invitation to Tite Street, followed by her personal note imploring him to come to tea. Thank you, Steve Friesen from uh, the Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave. And this is, this is in the collection of the BBCW. Uh, we know that Cody attended through, uh, through a, uh, an expense reimbursement. Cody's mother, JD, Lady Jane Wilde, was a writer and activist and intellectual, uh, Speranza as she called herself. And she fell on hard times after the death of her disgraced husband. She moved to Dublin to London to be near her two sons and start over. And it seems unlikely that Speranza would not have uh, missed any affair on Tite Street. Invitations to Cody often included Miss Cody, his daughter Arda, as seen here from Lady Wilde to her weekly Saturday salon. Unlike Henry Irving, these were not sumptuous gatherings, but popular because a starving artist could be guaranteed a glass and a sim simple meal and a chance to discuss one's work. Lady Wilde's door opened wider for intellectuals, and George Bernard Shaw, des Shaw described her saloons as desperate, her salons as desperate affairs. Oscar Wilde apparently awfully at often attended, striking an attitude of smiling boredom. Lady Jane was com comfortable enough to be directly in touch with Cody, uh, to ask for favors. 
And, and here's a note um, where she has sent a gift and thanks him for the tickets forwarded. When Henry, Henry Irving's name was not invoked for an invitation to a London society at home, the promise of attractive women would do. And a handwritten reminder for an evening with an opera singer, the hostess hopes to tempt Cody with the promise of beautiful girls. Expressing, <laughs> expressing her desire to visit him for a quiet chat, she closes by admonishing, do not fail me Wednesday. In an article on London, uh, reporter Catherine Cole wrote, one afternoon I went to an at-home in a charming house by Hyde Park, three stories high, drawing room upstairs, steep stairs rushing down the hall, and I was dazed by the great people. I have come to, and I've come to the conclusion that it is easy to be great in London. No one invited to these homes unless, is invited to these homes unless they've done something. The solemn young man began to talk to me. And how do you get here, he asked. Looking around the room, several compatriots, she replied, oh, I'm an American. As Buffalo Bill stood nearby eating a water lily of white sherbet with the heart of Judy Fruity. <laughs> now, in the uh, British circle surrounding the American exhibition, Lord Ronald Gower, president of the Welcoming, Welcoming Committee, was the younger son of the Duke of Sutherland. A respected sculptor and minister with close ties to Queen Victoria, Gower is best known for the statue of William Shakespeare at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. A world traveler, Gower too toured the American West. In his old diaries, 1881 to 1901, Gower recalls meeting the state of Nebraska at Gravesend with John Whitley. Gower's first impression of Cody described him as a striking type of man of splendid physique with much personal dignity. Dower, Gower is thought to have inspired Oscar Wilde's uh, character, Lord Henry Wotton, in Wilde's incendiary picture of Glory, Dorian Gray. Lily Langtree, also inspired a miniseries, was a London beauty and the mistress of the Princess of Wales. When he refused to pay her a monthly stipend, Wilde suggested she become an actress. And so His Royal Highness attended her performance and assured her success. And I enjoyed finding this note inviting uh, Cody for supper. Um, Henry Labouchere was a minister, publisher, and theatrical producer who was with his wife, uh, invited Cody to their grand garden production of Midsummer Night's Dream. Labouchere and Cody remained friendly, as this photograph seems to indicate. They renewed their friendship in 1893 when Cody returned to London. Ironically, Labouchere's MP authored the 1885 Labouchere Amendment, creating tougher language to expand the def definition of existing sodomy laws, which would ultimately ensnare Oscar Wilde 10 years later. Um, at the turn of the century, London boasted nearly 200 gentlemen's clubs. And Paul Mall, London's trendy club row, was frequented by actors, producers, and notables. Cody met the Prince of Wales at the Reform Club, and Irving invited uh, Cody to dinner at the Garrett Club the day after his arrival. Um, although Cody had been entertained in America's finest gentlemen's clubs, to be hosted at the Garrett in the company of leading British actor and his critics must have been a high honor. But Irving also invited Cody and company to the Lyceum for theatrical uh, entertainment and late night suppers. For large gatherings, dinner and the round were arranged on the Lyceum's main stage. Cody probably preferred the Lyceum's more intimate beefsteak room. Um, Irving uh, had transformed at hanging theater pictures, adding lighting, a long table, appointing a chef, and in installing a grill. Well, I'm just going to go for it. Um, <laughs> um, Ellen Terry, um, when when uh, John Singer Sargent wanted to paint of Ellen, wanted wanted to paint a painting of Ellen Terry as the uh, author of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in her character of Lady Macbeth, but she'd only sit for it unless it, she was a hit at it, and she was. So Henry Irving bought this portrait and hung it at the bath back of the beefsteak room, and I. I really love to imagine everybody seated and Ellen Terry making her entrance and walking to the end, sitting under her, her painting like a Scandinavian queen with uh, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody at her side. Um, I'd like to close with a, with, with a, with a few comments. Um, when, I, um, when I parachuted, we've heard this line, back into Cody, Wyoming several years ago, I wrote Al Simpson, who did not know that nearly 10, who I didn't know, and uh, recalled my dad, my fond memories of growing up in Cody, but admitted my concern about coming back to Wyoming as a gay man. 
I included with my letter a bound copy of all of my dad's articles, editorials, weekly columns, and prize-winning photographs, which I recovered here at the McCracken. And Al responded with a warm three-page letter, closing with this, if you're thinking of coming back to Wyoming, get on back, it's home. And since that time, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West has proven that it works every day to include and share more of the stories of all the diverse peoples of the American West by focusing on the evolution of William F. Cody himself. Um, and this is, inclusion is how we expand visitorship and viewership. And I, I mentioned that uh, uh, when, you, when you walk into a pitch session, you gotta be prepared to answer these two questions about Cody. Why is he relevant and who will be your audience? Um, and I believe that um, including more stories about more diverse people in the American West will create more visitorship for, for this space and it would create more interest uh, for, for a story about Cody uh, uh, going forward. Um, and as for the vast rural-urban divide, uh, I, a, a brighter spot to report. Now, within a month, month of each other, I was invited to lunch at the Ronald Reagan Library and the Robert Maplethorpe Foundation to tell them about my affection for William F. Cody. <laughs> and in my travels uh, to the best Western mu museums across the country, I never failed to close with, I wanted to come home to the West as who I am, and Buffalo Bill led the way. Thank you. Thank you so very much. What great presentations. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion there are some questions. Uh, but I have a question before a question, and that is do we have a microphone or microphones? So we don't. The, if you could repeat the question. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my job will be uh, interlocutor. So uh, I will do my best. So uh, let's do things maybe a little bit different, just because I'd like to get more questions on the floor, and we're, some, we're sometimes running out of time for questions. Um, could I get three questions? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, just sequentially, and then I'll ask people to respond to them. Great. Okay, so the question is um, about how, s how people working on the Wild West in Europe um, come at the subject in ways that are different from American scholars. That's a loose paraphrase. So good, we can run with that, but anything else? Anyone else have questions we want to take up? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, oh, but there's a bright light here. Please, if you'll have to speak up. So wonderful. So a question about one European luminary writing to another, um, not ever expecting uh, that correspondence to be made public. So that's a question for Greg, and we can go with that too. Let me get one more. So I'd like to get as many questions out here at the beginning as we can. Yeah, Patty. Okay, so is there cheer and optimism to be found in Buffalo Bill? Is there, is there a kind of common um, uh, uplifting message that 
that really, uh, yeah, of international appeal that, so that somehow transcends, it, it really, it's a, it's a question. No, we, yeah, we have, yeah, really, I mean, Cody really becomes this kind of Congress of um, rough and even um, enthusiastic writers. So there are three good questions, thanks very much. And what I'm gonna do is invite the three of you to come up to take the microphone, because otherwise people won't be able to hear your responses. So if you would be so kind. Why don't we start with the question about um, working in European archives and how that maybe is different from the American, working in the American archives. Right. So please. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, I totally agree to, to Patty. To her question, I see a re re resounding yes. Uh, I would not be here if I had not taken up this great interest in Buffalo Bill. I've made some wonderful friends here. I can't think of anyone here I've got a bad word to, to, uh, to, to say about. Um, the paradox, once again, Patty's concept comes up, it keeps coming up, um, is that it was a frontier show. It was all about racial frontiers, and yet it transcended frontiers and created cultural interactions you couldn't begin to b believe, like uh, Kicking Bear befriended a Presbyterian minister from the Free Church in, 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 in Glasgow, and that informed his unfolding spiritual consciousness. Now, w with a, a view to racial um, understanding and reconciliation, I would like to leave you with something I was told by a very wise old rabbi who helped me down the road. Say what you will against the Jews, but never forget who, inv who invented Saturdays. I do. Uh, uh, regarding the question that was directed to me, I'm, I'm afraid I have got nothing. Um, I, uh, I will say this, what intrigued me, and I would, I would ask this back of you all, what intrigued me is the primary, um, there's been really great recent scholarship on Bram Stoker and Henry Irving and Ellen Terry, and also there was a wonderful biographer, Richard Ellman, who, who wrote Wild. And in none of these biographies is William F. Cody mentioned or the Wild West. And I, I just, found that so fascinating and uh, 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 it, it made me wonder if it was possible. I mean, you all are scholars, I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I'm an accidental historian. Is it, could scholarly bias of Cody be at play in that? Um, so I, I, uh, I'll throw back a question at you. Thank you. Thinking of Chris's question about European versus American scholars, uh, I'm not really sure how to answer that either. Um, part of it comes back to this question of Cody studies as a ecumenical tradition that there's so much variety in the kinds of people um, that contribute um, that I would be hesitant to attribute uh, something like national character to a certain style of scholarship. Could it, it could have as much to do with um, their uh, academic background or um, even you know, within uh, professional academics like yourself or Alessandra, um, just the kind of training they've received or their disciplinary orientation. There's so many other factors in play. Uh, that said, I mean, uh, I think maybe some of the kinds of questions that are posed uh, may, may differ. I think about like my own preoccupation with uh, the international um, tours uh, as uh, a way of better understanding American national self-definition um, versus the, uh, you know, tracing the impact of the Wild West on Europe. Um, whereas uh, for European scholars, it, it almost, they're almost obliged to start with, you know, the archival account, the local archive, uh, because nobody's, nobody's really done that yet. And so they're, they're on the front lines of, of um, producing that documentary record. So I think if anything, that could be a key difference um, that's very much kind of functional uh, to what they are and what their opportunities are. 
So thanks. Let me have a go at um, Chris's question, too. So Buffalo Bill in Bologna uh, is the outgrowth of a project that involved 30 scholars. Um, we were uh, part of a project at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study, and the project was dedicated to exploring the impact of American popular culture on Europe and its reception. So the book got started looking at the impact side. What was the impact of not only the Wild West but other forms of American popular mass culture on Europe? Very quickly, as one of um, a handful of Americans involved in this project, it became very clear to me that the Europeans were not especially interested in talking about impact. They weren't interested in hearing about how the um, uh, American shows, American pop culture had an impact, left an impress on Europe. What they wanted to talk about was how Europeans, different groups of Europeans, actually responded to the show in different terms. So it was this really quite interesting mix between export, emphasis on export, and emphasis on reception. And that's kind of the fulcrum around which Buffalo Bill and Bologna um, turns. Let's turn to other questions. Yes, Mo is that Monica? Yes. Hi. So I'll just repeat the question. Um, is there a sense of anxiety in the show's reception, and does it, does it actually produce um, destabilization? Um, how do we actually read this show in the context of uh, London's theater scene, which is so extraordinarily diverse? So let me ask our panelists to respond, and then I see another hand. Is, is that Louis? Yeah. yeah what? Did you want to weigh in on that? Uh, weigh in on that, yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think what you, you've written about uh, maybe is Louis, Louis, could you just come up and yeah. the microphone, please? Sure. sure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I can talk well, they, but they're trying to, I think they're trying to record, too. Oh, and I definitely want to weigh in. <laughs> it's after all Buffalo Bill. Yeah. Well, and my response to Monica's question about anxiety was going to be to defer to Louis and, and just have you explain what you say in your chapter on the Wild West in London. So, well, uh, I'm I'm always up for talking about anxiety because it's so entertaining, right? <laughs> uh, no, I I mean I, as somebody who's written, um, I wrote an article once called Buffalo Bill Meets Dracula, uh, which is about William Cody and 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 his impact on Bram Stoker and Bram Stoker reworking the myth of the frontier through the Dracula novel, because um, there's an American, it's the American who kills Dracula in the novel. It's Quincy Morris, the Westerner, who I think is really based on Buffalo Bill. But I, the, the whole point of, of that was I, I, when you read that newspaper coverage, when I read the newspaper coverage of Buffalo Bill in London, there's a huge amount of anxiety about how powerful the Americans suddenly are. Uh, Britain is about to slip out of its, its place as the number one steel producer in the world. Uh, the, the Americans are going to supersede them. 
And it's not at all clear that they're going to be allies going forward. There's been a lot of tension between Britain and the United States, and there will be a lot more, right? Uh, so it, it, there's a, a lot of anxiety about what it means that these very warlike people have come from the frontier. Uh, yeah, they're really entertaining, but they sure have a lot of guns. Uh, and they're convinced, they're convinced that they never lose. They're absolutely convinced of this. And that's really worrisome uh, for a lot of people who feel that the British Empire is on the decline. The other, the other point I would just make is that um, I do think that Henry Irving, I, I agree with, with Monica that there's a lot of, uh, there's so many people in the orbit of the Wild West show, it's really hard to keep track. But Henry Irving is their primary cultural broker. He was not only England's leading Shakespearean actor, which in England, that is kind of being the repository for culture, of the, the culture of the nation, right? That is, that is really something. He's not only that, he'd been offered a knighthood uh, by Queen Victoria and he turned it down because he said it would give him an unfair advantage in the marketplace, that he had rivals in theater and that he wanted to be judged by performance not by the accolades. And he had to explain that to the queen and that took some doing, right? Uh, but he's the one in my reading of the sources who persuades her to issue a command performance for what is essentially a lot of people are calling a circus, right? And she loved the circus, but she didn't like people to know that so much. Uh, and so when he said, no, you really can't have this uh, as a command performance and he pushed it, uh, she went for it because it was Henry Irving. Right, and cultivating that friendship with Irving was one of, again, Cody is, we, we, there's a whole line of scholarship that says it's his, it's the publicists around him who were so good who build him into what he is. No, I really think he had such a sensibility about who to cultivate and how. Um, we heard a great talk about Captain Jack Crawford. I can't imagine him ever finding a way to cultivate Henry Irving, right? It would be preposterous. Uh, it would have been just as preposterous on the face of it for William Cody to do it, but he did because he was that kind of performance genius and kind of a, uh, he's also a genius of people. Uh, he, he really was. Um, that, anyway, that's my response and I'll let you guys go back to this. <laughs> so any of the speakers care to respond to Monica's question? <laughs> that's, that's probably a good place to end. So let's thank our panelists. <laughs>